We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Grab your Bible, open up to James chapter three. We're gonna spend some time talking about a part of our body. Uh, by the way, anyone know the strongest muscle in your body uh, in, in relation to size, all right? That part's important because the strongest muscle in your body, believe it or not, is your jaw muscle. You can put more pounds per square inch on something with your jaw muscle than any other muscle. But the strongest muscle in relation to size, anyone know what it is? It's our tongue. Crazy, right? How powerful your tongue is. Not just actually, the muscle is actually really, really strong, but we're going to talk today about how it's powerful in so many other ways. Uh, I went on a missions trip uh, probably about nine years ago. Uh, we were in this uh, village in Guatemala. And after the end of about 10 days being with the people of this village, they wanted to make us dinner. The, it was me and some students. And, and so we decided to graciously accept their uh, their you know, act of hospitality. And so we asked, well, what's for dinner? And they said, we're making beef. I'm like, that's awesome. I like beef, right? Everyone else, probably not everybody, but a lot of people enjoy beef. So we enjoy this meal. I'm telling you, this is the best beef I've ever had in my life. It was incredible. I'm a very picky eater, right? I, I'm going to ask you what it is before I eat it. And if it sounds weird, I'm probably not going to eat it. I'm not very kind like that. And so I'm like, beef, I'm fine with beef, right? So I enjoy it. I eat it. It's so good. I want the recipe. I'm like, I got to take this home. And, and they start giggling because they already know, someone's told them how picky I am and that they, if they tell me what I'm about to eat before I eat it, I wouldn't have had it. And it was cow tongue, all right? Not that, not that interesting for a lot of you. How, how many of you had tongue before? I was expecting it to be, once I heard about it, I'm thinking that it would be really tough because of how strong of a muscle it is, but it was actually incredibly like melt in your mouth kind of tender, which is interesting. Uh, anyway, so I've, the tongue is what we're going to talk about today, all right? And so hopefully you're at James chapter 3. And we're going to talk about how the tongue is incredibly powerful. The first two verses of chapter 3 say this. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. What God wants us to know through James is that if you knew how to control your tongue, you would have enough self-control that everything else could be controlled by you. The tongue is the most difficult, most powerful muscle in the body in that it has the ability to, to do a lot of good and a lot of bad. And that's what James wants us to see. The tongue is something, and the way he says it, it's so powerful. He says, for if we could control our tongues... We could control ourselves in every other way. The tongue is the hard, is hardest thing in your body to learn how to control, according to God. So let's talk about that. The way I'm going to format our message today, and you have some notes in front of you, in the next uh, uh, 10 verses, we're going to read James from 1 all the way through 12. So the next 10 verses show us six different word pictures for the tongue. And it also is going to teach us six different lessons about our tongue based on these word pictures. So here's the first word picture we're going to come across, is that our tongue is like a bit. Now you might know what, not know what a bit is, but a bit is that piece of metal that you put into a horse's mouth, right? And then you hook something onto both sides and whoever's riding that horse can control the horse and the direction that it walks and goes based on that piece of metal in the horse's mouth. That's a bit. Now, here's the lesson we learn. Ready? The first lesson about our tongue is that your words are powerful. Our words are very powerful. You think about the size of a horse. 
A horse, a full-grown horse can weigh up to 2,200 pounds. That's over a ton. A huge animal, right? Here's what James says in verse 3. It says, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. You think about the size of a bit compared to the size of the horse. I think we would all agree that a 2,200 pound horse is very powerful. Well, what James is saying is that little itty bitty piece of metal, it's so small, that's probably why we call it a bit, right? It's a bit, it's nothing. That little piece of metal is so powerful that it can control something that you would consider more powerful. That's how powerful a bit is. And so the, the lesson we ought to learn about our tongue is that our tongues, uh, the words that we say, they're incredibly powerful. It might seem like a small part of your body. It might seem like a small thing, just, to, just some words, right? You've probably heard the phrase before, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? You've heard that before. That's something we say to say, you know, our words, they're, they're small, you know, I, uh, your, your fists and maybe some sticks and some stones, they can do harm to the body, but words. Now, we all know that that's not true, right? We know that your words are incredibly powerful. In fact, for many of you in this room, I bet you've been more wounded in this life by words than you've ever been by sticks or stones. The words of someone else uh, what they said about you, what they said, uh, uh, how they identified you, some word, I don't know what it is. Uh, those words are incredibly powerful. Maybe it's been some kind words, some words that helped reshape your, your identity, and they, they, they've been really, really helpful words. You, you heard the gospel out of someone's mouth. Your words are powerful. So much has been helped in this world, and so much has been destroyed in this world by words. Marriages, families, churches have been destroyed by words. Our words are powerful. Proverbs 15 verse 4 says this, Gentle words are a tree of life. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. I love how in this proverb we have some really strong word pictures, right? It says that a, a gentle word is like a tree. Can you think of anything stronger, more powerful than like a giant oak tree? And how, how strong is an oak tree? God's word says, I want you to understand your words, your, your, a gentle word, a kind word spoken to someone has that kind of strength. Likewise, you know, a deceitful tongue can crush the spirit. That word crushing, you're picturing something like a horse falling on top of you. You're going to get crushed. Your words are powerful. That's the first word picture. Here's the second one that, that James mentions is this word picture of a rudder. You know, that, that thing on the back of a ship that controls where it goes. And here's the lesson we learn from the rudder is that your words are a choice. You have the ability to choose the words that come out of your mouth. James says in verse 4, And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, in the same way the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. So like a, like a bit... A, the rudder of a ship is actually relatively very small compared to the size of the ship, right? Your tongue is very small compared relatively to the size of the rest of your body. But boy, is it powerful. And boy, does, it, does this passage remind us that you have a choice. Notice what it says here about the pilot of the ship. It says the pilot, that the rudder will help the giant ship go wherever the pilot chooses to take it. In other words, you are the pilot of your tongue. You are the one who decides whether or not the rudder is pointing to the right or to the left or going straight. You get to decide the words that come out of your mouth. You have the ability to learn self-control over your words. You have a choice. You have a choice in the matter. Think about it this way. Every word you say can be carefully selected or flippantly uttered. 
You have the ability to just let words roll out without thinking about them. Uh, and just that they're just going to come. That's what's going to happen. You're going to be able to flippantly utter a whole bunch of words. Or you can learn that each word is a choice and choose to control what comes out of your mouth. You know, on average, the average person speaks 11 million words per year. Now, we all know somebody who beats that record, right? And everyone's like, man, they, whew. We all probably know someone who's a little quieter than that. But the average person, a million choices that you make every year. If you live to the age of 90, you make a billion choices of what words come out of your mouth. A billion words in your lifetime. And we have to understand that when you're speaking a million words out of your mouth and each one is a choice, well, we have to be very careful about what words we choose because that's a lot of choices that we make on a daily basis. First Peter 3.10 says this, For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Notice what's said here. You keep it. You control it. You have the choice about what comes out of your mouth. Have you ever heard the phrase, uh, loose lips sink ships? You know where that, that comes from? It's a wartime phrase. Something that, you know, uh, a whole, you know, army would, would be told, listen, make sure, you, listen, you're going to go out now, you get some time off, you're going to go out and relax and go on vacation, spend some time at home, you know, R&R, &R. but remember, loose lips sink ships, right? You sit there and you're maybe made a new friend, you're sitting there in the pool on vacation and, and you think that you're just relaxing and, and you're talking about all sorts, and you're just, your words are flying a mile a minute before you know it. You've given up the location of all sorts of different secrets. You, they know where the ships are, they know how many people are in each one, and you're just sitting there not being careful about what you're saying. Loose lips sink ships. And so the, the reminder with that phrase is that you have the ability to choose to not have loose lips. Loose lips just is words just rolling out. Someone who is controlling their lips, controlling their mouth, is making intentional choices to be careful about what they say. All right, the next one we find in James 3, the, the second part of verse 5, it says this, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. So that's your, your third word picture, is the word picture of a spark. And the lesson we're going to learn from this spark is that your words are dangerous. Your words are incredibly dangerous. Now, before I explain why I'm saying that they're dangerous, uh, when, I, when I talk about this idea of a spark setting a whole forest on fire, we've seen this happen a lot in the news recently, haven't we? We hear about fires that are out of control in California and fires that are out of control in Australia and fires that are out of control in Hawaii and fires and just all sorts of... And, and listen, the, one of the biggest fires that's been recorded in, in, in California history it was it's called the Ranch Fire. 400,000 acres burned. It all started from a single spark. And that spark, by the way came from a construction worker who had a metal hammer and a metal stake and was hammering that thing into the ground. And there was a spark. And that spark lit some dry grass on fire. And that fire got quickly out of control. And before you know it, 400,000 acres of land, many lives, homes, farms, livelihoods, all destroyed because of something so small as a spark. So James wants you to know that your words are dangerous. Now here's what's interesting about that word though. Dangerous doesn't mean bad. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't speak. You see a fire, I love the idea of a spark because a spark, here, here's the difference. There's a spark that's controlled and a spark that's out of control. Right? You can go into your fireplace and spark and start a fire and it's controlled, it's confined. And what is it going to do? It's going to provide warmth. It's going to be helpful to you and your family. Right? You can go to your stove right, and hit the little tick, 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 
right? It's going to get a bunch of sparks. And that spark is helpful because it's going to start a fire. And you're going to use that fire to cook food and to provide nourishment for your family. Fire can be very helpful to you, though it's very dangerous. And the difference is, is that one, there's a control factor to it. And the other one is out of control. So the truth is, though, that your, your words, your words are dangerous. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says, The tongue can bring death or life. You see that? It's a dangerous thing. But it doesn't necessarily mean it has to bring death. It can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences, both good and and bad consequences. How about Psalm 141, verse 3? It says, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. There's a reason why we set fires in fire pits. There's a reason we set a fire in a fireplace. Because we understand that fire can be very helpful when it's controlled. And what this simple prayer is, God, would you set a boundary around the fire that's going to come out of my mouth? Would you let it be controlled? Would you help me to realize that my words are dangerous? And then there's this really unique verse in James, the next verse in James, uh, James 3, which is verse 6. It says, and among all the parts of the body... The tongue is a flame of fire. It, it is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. That's an interesting verse. It says that your tongue can, that last sentence, it can set your whole life on fire. Obviously, that's something pretty dangerous if it can set your whole life on fire. But think about what this, this word, this wording in English, the original Greek, when it says your whole life on fire, what, it's, what it goes back to is two Greek words. The first Greek word is about a, a wheel or a circle, like a cycle. And the second word is, is the word genesis or birth. And so basically what it's saying is this whole wheel that starts at the beginning of your life, this, this cycle that starts when you're born. In other words, listen, your tongue, you, you have been born with a sin nature. It's just part of the fall from Adam and Eve in the garden. All of us in this room, the moment you were born, the, mor- the moment the cycle of your life started rolling, your tongue has the ability to be dangerous. It's right there from the very beginning And that actually leads to our fourth word picture. And it's a word picture of a wild animal. A wild animal. And here's the lesson I want us to learn from this word picture. Your words can be trained, but not completely tamed. Now, I know a lot of you, you might look up in the beginning of James chapter 3 in your Bible, and it's probably got the heading taming the tongue. You've probably heard someone preach before. Pastor, I I heard a message once where someone told me how to tame the tongue. Well, I want to tell you that what scripture says when I read it is that you can certainly train your tongue, but you're never going to be able to completely tame it. Here's what it says in verse seven. It says, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. So what does that mean? They have these two verses that says that not a single one of us in this room can completely tame our tongue. Like that seems discouraging to me. What do you mean? I've heard whole messages preached where we're supposed to tame the tongue, and now you're saying that it's not technically possible. Well, let me, let me encourage you in a couple ways. Number one, The Bible's really clear that you cannot tame your tongue. You're not able to do it on your own strength. It doesn't mean that there isn't some taming that can happen to your tongue. There's certainly, we call that training. In fact, in Matthew 19, verse 26, it says, Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, everything is possible. 
What might not be possible for you, in other words, it might not be possible for you to tame your tongue. But God's word wants us to know that with God, all things are possible. But I think what James is really getting at here is don't be deceived into thinking that your tongue can be completely tamed this side of heaven. I want to introduce you to a guy named West Mathewson. I'm going to put a picture of him up on the screen. This guy right here, his name's West, and these are his, his two lions. Uh, their names are Tanner and Demi. So that's Tanner and Demi. They're two lions, and uh, they, these lions actually uh, were set aside to be killed because they, they, they mauled a human. These two lions killed a human being. And so they were going to be killed for, for doing that. And Tanner, or West, uh, right here, he, he was a lover of lions, a trainer of lions, says, listen, give them to me. I'll, I'll, I'll tame them. I'll train them. And so you can see in these pictures, they clearly have a great friendship. They love him. He loves them. And all sorts of pictures of West Mathewson online about how friendly these lions are and how well he gets along. Clearly, they're buddies. Clearly, they love each other. Clearly, he spent a lot of time training and taming these lions. But do you know at the end of the day, a lion is a wild animal. A lion, in its instincts, right, deep down inside, it can be trained but West learned the hard way. One day he was roughhousing with his friends, Tanner and Demi, and the rough play got a little too rough, and their instincts kicked in, and he ended up being mauled to death and killed by his friends. And here's why. It's because at the end of the day, a lion is a wild animal. You can certainly train it. You can do all sorts of things to help it be more tame and to, to be able to interact with humans and to, to enjoy being pet by a, a human male and all that. That's great. But at the end of the day, the instinct of a lion, just like the instinct of your tongue, from the very beginning has this sin nature where if you get so comfortable thinking, you know what, I've done all the training my tongue needs. It now does exactly what I wanted to do. It says nice things all the time. It does. The more comfortable you get around your tongue, the more comfortable West got around his lions, eventually it ended up killing him. You have to understand that your tongue is like a wild animal. It can be trained, but it's never going to be completely tamed. Not on this side of heaven. You see, we have to always be alert around our tamed tongue. Because it is still a wild animal and will slip back into its sin nature when we get too comfortable. You know, one thing that a lion trainer will say, if you're training a lion to be tame, if you're trying to tame a lion Really, the only way to do it really successfully is to tame that lion from the moment that it's a cub. You have to raise that lion to be around humans and to interact with humans. And by the way, I think that's an incredible lesson that parents and young people in this room, you need to learn. One of the easiest ways to tame your tongue is to do it from birth. To learn while you're young how to control the words that come out of your mouth. Parents, the more that you tame and train the tongue of your children right now, the more beneficial and the more likely. In fact, here's what scripture says about it. In Proverbs 22, 6, it says, direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. We have the ability to train. Some of you are in this room right now, you're probably... Uh, maybe you're an adult, right? And you gave your life to Jesus in adulthood. And for many years, your tongue was not being trained. You said whatever you wanted to say. And now that you're an adult, and now that you're a follower of Jesus, you recognize how incredibly hard it is to get your tongue under control because, frankly, it's a wild animal. And at the end of the day, even a, a cub trained from infancy still instinctually a wild animal. And so we need to be careful and recognize that our words can be trained, but not completely tamed. Or the next word picture we're going to see in the next three verses, in James 3, verses 9 through 11, it says, Sometimes 
Our tongue, it praises the Lord and Father. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. In fact, circle those. If you got your Bible open, circle those words. It, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? And so here's that, that next word picture. Number five is the word picture of a spring, right? There's a, a spring where water's coming up out of the ground, and it's saying does, when, when water comes up, comes up out of the ground, is both fresh water going to come up and salty water? No, that doesn't happen. It's either going to have salt water or, or fresh water. It's not going to be both. You're not going to have both kinds of waters come out of one spring. That doesn't make sense. It's not right. So here's your next lesson from this spring is that your words matter. Your words matter. They are not insignificant. They're not unimportant. They're not, you know, impotent. They're very powerful. The words you say mean something. Can you imagine if you just finished running like a marathon? For some of us, that's too hard to imagine, right? Let's just (laughs) imagine you just ran a 5K, a 1K, okay? (laughs) Imagine you just... Walked around the block a couple times, right? And, and it's a hot day out, all right? Imagine it's not 32 degrees out like it is now. It's hot out, and you're done, and you're sweating, and you want something to drink. And you see that finish line, and as you pass through it, you see all those tables set up with, with ice cold water. And you're so excited because you go and you grab one of those to refresh your thirst, and you drink it. And instead of fresh, cold ice water, you have salt water. Imagine how frustrated that would be in that moment, right? You'd spit that out. You would not enjoy it. It would be devastating in that moment. Like, listen, I just want something refreshing. Your words matter. When you go up to someone and you have the ability to communicate something out of your mouth into their life and into their ears and into their heart, you can either speak words that are refreshing or words that are bitter. Your words matter. It's going to be one or the other. And you know where those words come from? The Bible says, right, that our words bubble up from the well of our hearts. The words that come out of your mouth, they're, they're like a spring in that they bubble up from your heart. Your heart is going to be, listen, if you're wicked and think a lot of gross things and full of hatred and full of pride and full of greed and all these things are in your heart. Well, the words that come out of your mouth are going to reflect that because the words that come out of your mouth bubble up from your heart. Here's the way Jesus puts it in Matthew 12. He says, you brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account. You must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Here's the point. Your words matter. Your words matter. All right, here's our sixth word picture. Our sixth word picture is that of a fruit tree, right? So write down fruit tree. And here's the lesson we're going to learn from this word picture. Your words say a lot about who you are. Your words communicate to those around you who you are. People will find out what kind of person you are based on the words that you speak. In James verse, uh, 3, verse 12, it says, Does a fig tree produce olives, or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Listen, I'm not like a, I, I've never studied like trees or plants or anything like that, 
But I bet any one of us in this room, if there was a huge tree on this stage and you're like, listen, I don't know much about bark types and I can't identify this tree based on its leaves. I don't know how, if it, this tree is supposed to be big or small. I have no idea. But if you look up on the tree and there's lemons on it, what are you going to tell me about what kind of tree it is? It's a lemon tree, right? How do we identify the tree based on its fruit? And the Bible says that that's how people will identify you based on the fruit of the words that come out of your mouth. If what comes out of your mouth sounds more like the world, if there's just certainly and constantly coarse joking and profane words and things that break people down and rude harshness and all these things, are, that's what's coming out of your mouth. People are going to identify you not as a follower of Jesus, because that's not who Jesus is. But similarly, if you allow things that are helpful to come out of your mouth, and things that are kind, and things that, that reflect, if you let the gospel come out of your mouth, people are going to say, well, that's a follower of Jesus right there. The question is, if people were to identify you in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your barracks, in your, on your bus ride, in your small group. They're trying to figure out whether or not you are a follower of Jesus or not based solely on the fruit that they see hanging in the tree of your words. How would they identify you? It's something we're thinking about. Matthew twelve thirty three says, a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. What are, you word, what are your words, what do your jokes say about who you are? All right, what we do here at ACC on a weekly basis is we always want to make sure there's something very practical that you can grab onto. We don't want to just open up God's word and learn more about what he has to say and then go out and, and do the same things we did before. So we want to get real practical. And the way we do that is with a moment we call, what now, God? Simply asking God, what do you want me to do with this information? And here's what I want to challenge you to do. The first thing I want to challenge you to do is simply this, is to ask God to help you train your tongue. You might think you got it under control. You might think you don't need any help at this point. But I want every single one of us in this room, write that down. I want you to ask God to help you train your tongue. Listen, if you tried to do it on your own, you're not going to be very successful. But with God, all things are possible. God can help you grab the reins that are attached to the bit of your tongue, right? And to control it. And the second thing I want to challenge all of us to do is to think before you speak. Think before you speak. Now, I have THINK capitalized because it's an acronym that I want to give you now as our kind of takeaway. Before I give you that acronym, let's look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28. It says, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. So real, real quick, quick poll. How many of you want to be godly over evil? You would rather be godly. All right, then you guys need to pay attention, right? Because the Bible says we need to think before we speak. And here's an acronym we use in my house uh, we have this written up in the kids' schoolroom. If they say something that doesn't fit into this, it's often like, hey, which one of these was that? <laughs> which, was this T-H-I N or K? Tell me which one that fit into, because I don't think it fit into any of them. Here's the T. Ask yourself, the thing that you just said, or the thing you're about to say, is it truthful? Are you speaking words that are true, or are you being deceptive? There's a story of a butcher, and the butcher is there, and a woman comes in and says, I need a chicken. I'm, I'm making chicken for the family tonight. Can you give me a chicken? So he goes into the freezer, and he only has one chicken left. And so he grabs it and brings it out and puts it on the scale, and he says, all right, it's two pounds. And she says, oh, no, that's not going to be big enough. And he says, 
He doesn't want to lose a sale. So he takes the chicken, he goes back to the freezer and comes out with the same chicken and puts it back on the scale. And he says, all right, three pounds. She goes, oh, that'll be perfect. I'll take both of them. (laughs) You know, see, our words have the ability to get us into a lot of hot water when we don't say things that are true. Right? We have the ability to speak words that are honest and real. And so ask yourself, is this thing I just said, is it true? The second uh, letter is H. To ask yourself, is it helpful? Is what I'm about to say going to help and encourage? Ephesians 4.29 says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And by the way, when we're talking about is it helpful, uh, I want to talk about gossip for just a moment. When you gossip, remember the definition of gossip that we use around here, right? Gossip is when you say something about someone else to another person that is neither, the other person is neither part of the problem or part of the solution. So you're sharing someone else's business with someone who's not part of the problem and they're not part of the solution. In other words, the words that are coming out of your mouth are not helpful. They're just going to cause more problems. If you're sharing something with someone who is part of the problem or who, who is part of the solution, your words are helpful, not pointless and harmful. Someone once said, that there is only one thing as difficult as unscrambling an egg, and that's unspreading a rumor. Proverbs 16, verse 28 says, A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. Are your words helpful? The I, it stands for, is it inspiring? In other words, are your words actually helping to spur someone on into Christ-likeness? Are you helping to encourage and train someone in discipleship? So not just helpful, but actually pushing someone towards something better. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. So I, is it inspiring? How about the end? Is it necessary? Now, this is a tricky one because we all know someone, right, who loves the sound of their own voice. They've got something to say about everything. And at the end of the day, you, you, you look back and you're thinking, man, they, they way surpassed that 11 million words a year. And most of what they said wasn't really necessary. It didn't add anything. It was just someone liking to speak. Here's, here's what the Bible says about that. Proverbs 10, 19 says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Proverbs 21, verse 23 says, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. The more you talk, the more you give this thing, which is impossible to completely tame, the opportunity to hurt someone or to do something that's not supposed to do. And so choose when it's necessary to speak. And when, I think about these questions, does what you're about to say improve on silence? Or is silence actually better? Or would it be better left unsaid? And here's the last one, K stands for kind. Is it kind? The words I'm about to say, are they, are they good? Are they pouring truth into someone else in a way that, that brings up and bubbles up and encourages them in a way that, that just re- reflects kindness? Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. You know, I want a, a little side note here when I talk about are your words kind. I have a problem, uh, some, a weakness that I know, uh, I know about, I'm working on. My staff tells me sometimes about this weakness. Um, 
there's a, there's a, a phrase that goes like this, clarity is kindness. Sometimes what we do when we want to avoid a little bit of conflict or we're like, hey, don't want to upset someone, we don't want to ruffle feathers, what we do is we, we beat around the bush with our words. And we want, we have a certain expectation, but we are not clear with people that we expect to meet that expectation. We just kind of say something and don't get real clear with it. And then we cause a bunch of problems because at the end of the day, clarity, when we speak with our words and we say not just what we are trying to say, but we say it clearly, we try to avoid sarcasm. We try to avoid vagueness. We try to avoid those different things. We can actually be kind by communicating clearly. And so maybe that's something you need to work on. But here's the deal. We know that God wants each of us to learn something about the power of our tongue, the power of our words. So I want to encourage you, two things, right? Ask God to help you train your tongue. Some of you, you need it more than others. But ask God to help you train your tongue. Second, think before you speak. Learn to process what you're about to say before you say it so you get yourself in less trouble and help encourage and advance the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for just 13 verses in James, or 12 verses in James chapter three. The word pictures you've painted for us through James that help us understand more the power of our tongue. We understand that our tongues are dangerous, but they can do a lot of good and a lot of harm. God, we understand that our words are choices, that we have the ability to choose what it is that we say, and that every word that we choose matters. It makes a difference. And we understand that because of our sin nature, our tongues can never fully be tamed. So we need to be very careful with them. We need to train them and teach them how to to do and, and say what is good and right. We need to think before we speak. God, we recognize these these truths. God, we understand that, that, you're, that our words bubble up from our hearts. God, we understand that each word matters to you as it builds your kingdom or tears it apart. God, we love you. And we thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.